I'm going to be speaking about how nanopore sequencing can be applied to uh, genomic surveillance of the malaria parasite Plasmodium falciparum. I'll give a bit of background on malaria, and then I'll describe the assay that we designed and its implementation in Ghana. I'll describe the results focusing on drug resistance and the leading malaria uh, vaccine candidate called CSP. And I'll describe some training and capacity strengthening work that we did in the north of Ghana uh, in a place called Navrongo. So, some background on malaria. Um, malaria is a single cell parasite that is transmitted by the bite of the female Anopheline mosquito. Uh, as you can see from this figure, it has its greatest impact on uh, children living in sub-Saharan Africa. So the World Health Organization estimates that there were 247 million malaria cases and 619,000 deaths in 2021. 95% of those are in sub-Saharan Africa, and around four in every five uh, are in children under the age of five. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the life cycle, but essentially uh, the uh, mosquito, when it takes a blood meal, injects the parasites and they passage through the liver, but all of the pathology arises from when the parasites uh, amplify in human red blood cells. Uh, so the red cells split open, that drives fever. Uh, they can also stick to major organs, kidneys, and the brain uh, causing severe disease, and the life cycle is completed by the bite of another mosquito. So it's in those blood stages that we can access the parasite, both for making a diagnosis of malaria and in order to do genomics. And why would we want to do genomics? Uh, well, antimalarial resistance has been a major problem in the control of malaria uh, going back decades and continuing, unfortunately, to the present. So here you can see a range of antimalarial drugs and then the date of when resistance was first described, marked with an R. Multiple drugs of uh, resistance has emerged, often in Southeast Asia, before then being described in Africa. And the current frontline treatment for Plasmodium falciparum malaria is marked with the arrow called ACT, which stands for artemisinin-based combination therapy. Uh, and resistance was first reported, um, or at least partial resistance, in Southeast Asia in uh, the late 2000s, and in the last couple of years has been reported in East Africa. And the WHO has highlighted this as a major issue uh, and released this technical document, a strategy to respond to antimalarial resistance in Africa, highlighting the importance of surveillance in order to monitor for the emergence and spread of resistance. And uh, checking for resistance in malaria parasites is quite tricky. You have to get the parasite out of the blood, grow it in the laboratory. Sometimes it just doesn't grow. Um, so with genomics, you have a more scalable and affordable way uh, at population scale to monitor for resistance trends. Uh, in parallel with drugs, another major development in the malaria world in the last few years has been um, the rollout of the leading malaria vaccine candidate, RTSS. Uh, so this was recommended by the WHO for use in areas of moderate to high malaria transmission intensity and is now being implemented in three countries, Ghana, Malawi, and Kenya, with a plan to roll out across uh, the malaria endemic world. Um, that vaccine targets an antigen called circumsporozoic protein, or CSP, which has a very repetitive region of four peptides, NANP, repeated um, up to 30 times, and then a C-terminal domain of the gene. Um, so being able to monitor for any changes in that gene as this vaccine becomes increasingly widely used is also desirable. So that leads me to the key study aims, and I've already mentioned um, my friend and colleague from the University of Ghana, Dr. Lucas Amengaritego, and um, together we aimed to perform uh, nanopore sequencing in Ghana, and the, the kind of key philosophy behind this project was that absolutely everything from sample collection to processing to sequencing to bioinformatics analysis and final interpretation all needed to be done in Ghana, uh, led by Lucas's team. Um, and we wanted to build a platform that was sustainable, that had a pretty simple and straightforward workflow that could be implemented uh, in endemic settings. Using that method, we wanted to describe the prevalence of the major antimalarial drug resistance markers, the most well-characterized markers that we could really focus in on, uh, as well as diversity in that vaccine candidate, CSP. Um, 
and to engage in training and capacity strengthening by uh, having people in Lucas's team, both in Accra in the south and in a relatively um, more resource-limited setting in the rural north of Ghana in Navrongo, uh, working with the Navrongo Health Research Center to have them um, participate in the research and actually become part of what we were doing. So I'm going to describe the assay that we used. Um, these were some of the key mutations. Uh, you don't need to uh, sort of learn all of these, but um, for example, we would target a particular region of the gene chloroquine resistance transporter uh, with one mutation that's very informative for resistance to uh, the antimalarial drug chloroquine, uh, and so on for these other markers. We did that with a multiplex PCR. Um, this is just a gel electrophoresis image of uh, a range of, of falciparum lab isolates that all have kind of weird three-letter acronym names. Um, and you can see the, uh, the fragments there, which even by eye, it's quite obvious um, uh, by the size that you're expecting for each fragment. This is with pure falciparum DNA. We also tested it with uh, mock clinical isolates. So this was uh, parasite DNA mixed with humans down to very low parasitemias, which reflects what you often see clinically. Um, and we've also tried it with very low volume blood samples that you can get easily from the field. Uh, and we know what the genotype should be for all of these lab isolates because they're very well described, and we found complete agreement um, using R10 sequencing chemistry, which I'll describe more in a moment, uh, with what we were expecting. So that uh, was very encouraging and led to us uh, testing the uh, sequencing assay uh, at these two sites in Ghana in West Africa, Accra uh, in the south, the capital, uh, and Navrongo up in the north, um, so literally opposite ends uh, with a lot of traveling between the two sites. Um, Accra is, is the capital. It's a very urban environment. We were working in partnership with a hospital, Lekma Hospital, um, where malaria is perennial, whereas Navrongo in the north is a very rural area. We were working with um, rural community health clinics primarily, and uh, malaria is very seasonal, and we went during the height of the rainy season when transmission intensity is very high. Um, so because of the portability of nanopore, it meant we could work across these different ecological zones. This was the workflow, so we collected the samples. The data I'm going to show today was from venous blood samples, so a slightly higher volume of a few mil mils. But as I said, we have now tested it on small volume of blood that you can blot onto, onto filter papers called dry blood spots. Um, and the assay works very well from that as well. We extract the DNA, do the PCR, the nanopore sequencing. So that's all the wet lab side. Um, we had real-time base calling using super accurate base calling with Guppy uh, on some laptops that we brought with us with high-powered GPUs. Um, and then we had an informatics workflow called, which we called NanoRave, the Nanopore Rapid Analysis and Variant Explorer tool, um, where the reads are mapped to the reference sequences, which is the uh, drug resistance genes. Uh, we called variants using Madaka uh, haploid, uh, and then interpret the variant call files. And all of that was the real-time informatics side. Um, which ran off uh, you know, the same laptop, basically. So what you see here was the full sequencing informatics and analysis workstation, um, which we were able to travel between those two field sites and perform the entire workflow in those two sites. Uh, so for the kind of geeks in the audience, uh, I'm definitely one of them. Um, these were the specs of that laptop. So the GPU was a um, NVIDIA RTX 3080. Uh, essentially, that's just a high-spec gaming laptop. Um, and all of the sequencing was done on a MinION using the R10.4. And we've now started using the R10.4.1, uh, which is also working really well. Um, with the real-time base calling using Minnow, uh, and then the NextFlow pipeline that I've mentioned. So uh, here's the pipeline actually working. Um, we get the uh, read data produced from the real-time base calling. We then do some quality checks um, using some programs like Nanoplot. The key step is the mapping of those reads to the reference genomes, which happens using Minimap2. And then there's a few variant callers that we've tried. Um, and in this case, we're using Madaka haploid variant caller. Uh, and that whole process, this is a screenshot of the laptop as it's running. Um, and uh, this is sped up about tenfold. But um, at the end of it, you get coverage statistics and the zipped variant files. Uh, and in this case, it took eight minutes for a batch of 14 samples. We were doing multiplex batches, typically of 24 samples per flow cell. Um, and it took around 18 or 19 minutes to run on our laptop. So I'll move on now to the results.
Um, we packed quite a lot into a pretty short space of time. So in the first few weeks, we collected around 140 samples and excluded some that were very low parasitemia or that the, we didn't get much DNA from extraction. And then we did the PCRs uh, and then the nanopore sequencing and analysis. Um, so within about six weeks, we could generate um, end to end uh, over 100 samples um, uh, through to the final um, analysis, which I'll show you now. We had very, very high coverage uh, using our Amplicon sequencing assay. Um, so in excess of you know, well, thousands of X coverage for each Amplicon, even the lowest Amplicon covered, um, uh, which was CSP, had over 1,000 X. So we're very confident that we could use this assay for higher levels of multiplexing than for 24. Certainly, it could go to 96, if not higher. Um, this figure shows the frequencies of resistance to uh, some of the major antimalarial drugs that we tested for. Uh, one interesting finding was that chloroquine, uh, now basically all of the parasites were chloroquine susceptible. Had you gone back to Ghana in a time machine 10 years ago, most of them would have been resistant. So most likely that reflects the changing antimalarial policy in Ghana where they, they moved away from chloroquine because there was a lot of resistance. Artemisinin uh, became in combination uh, the, the frontline treatment, and so perhaps the sensitive parasites are now sort of creeping back in. We didn't find any markers of resistance to artemisinins, which is the final column, um, so that's reassuring. There was a lot of resistance to sulfadoxine and pyrimethamine. Uh, these drugs are used in combination called SP, and although they are not used uh, to treat malaria anymore, they are used in Ghana for uh, a kind of form of prophylaxis for um, uh, in pregnancy to pre prevent pregnancy uh, malaria, which is a very serious condition. We didn't find any of the high-level resistance. That means it stops working for that use case, um, but clearly that's a, a good example of where this kind of data is useful to keep monitoring while these interventions are being used. Um, we were able to then compare some of these findings with uh, equivalent samples that had been sequenced using Illumina technology. Um, so this plot is from the large Illumina whole genome data resource called the PF7 data set. And just looking at Ghana, you can see most of those parasites were chloroquine susceptible with Illumina as well. So we're in agreement with that. Focusing now on the vaccine antigen CSP, uh, CSP, as I mentioned, has a really repetitive region which Illumina would really struggle to sequence. Uh, this is a consensus sequence taken from one of the lab isolates and literally just blasted it. And I was super happy uh, the first time I did this and got 100% base perfect sequence at the consensus level, uh, including going right the way through that highly repetitive region uh, where Illumina reads would completely mismap. Um, so that's another good example of where uh, Nanopore would give an edge uh, over short read technologies to access these kinds of complex antigens. Looking at that C terminal domain of CSP, which is included in the vaccine, um, this is a plot showing uh, mutations that have been found along the C terminal domain uh, with the Illumina data in gray and the Nanopore data in orange. And essentially, we discovered all of the same markers. Um, and uh, statistically, there was no difference in the frequencies that we found them. So we're able to detect all of the same uh, uh, SNP variations in that C terminal domain. Um, I'm going to move on now to describe some of the training activities that we did, um, focusing more in the north, uh, in Navrongo. Um, and this was certainly something that uh, Lucas was very passionate about, to make sure that we had the team in Navrongo doing the sequencing themselves. And Lucas and I designed this course, an introduction to pathogen genomics, uh, which included um, you know, lectures, laboratory work, which was led by my colleague, uh, Sophia Gerges. Um, and, as I said, going through all of the sequencing and the bioinformatics on site. And because we brought the laptop with us, we were able to um, kind of do all of that in Navrongo, which otherwise uh, would not have been possible. Um, we asked for feedback from the uh, participants, and uh, I was very uh, pleased to see that of the people who responded, 100% um, said that it was useful. Um, most of them said it was, they would definitely apply the knowledge of this course in the future, uh, uh, with one person saying they probably would. Um, and I've just picked out some of the um, written feedback that we got. Uh, there was a lot of interest in applying nanopore to um, the pathogens that are seen and are a high priority for the region other than malaria. So northern Ghana is in the meningitis belt. There was a lot of interest in uh, meningococcal disease. 
in pneumococcal disease where um, pneumonia, particularly in young children, is still a major issue. So this first person says that they want to use nanopore in their study of bacterial genomics. They said it brings their dream of working on bacterial genomics closer to reality. Another person said that genomics seems to be the future of clinical research, which was very exciting. And then one person, the only thing they wrote is that they were ecstatic about nanopore sequencing. Um, so that was really great. Um, I've got some conclusions. Uh, we were able to use nanopore to provide real-time data uh, that was relevant to malaria surveillance, malaria epidemiology, focusing on the really high-priority public health use cases of drug resistance and this vaccine um, target that's being deployed in this area uh, while we were doing this project. Crucially, we could implement this entirely end-to-end -end in an endemic setting in a portable way, uh, in a way that was not super resource intensive, uh, with a workflow that was pretty straightforward uh, and could be taught uh, and, and deployed in actually quite a short space of time. That brings data generation and data processing and analysis and interpretation uh, right to the data users to the places where these, uh, this disease is having its greatest impact, which in my view is the pathway to maximizing the impact of genomics and also to make the uh, genomics field more equitable rather than having sequence, uh, samples shipped out of countries uh, into the global north. Um, all of this work can be done in an endemic country. Uh, for small um, single nucleotide polymorphisms, our results were comparable to Illumina, uh, and as I've mentioned, looking at the uh, CSP antigen, making use of the long nanopore reads, uh, we actually could also access uh, variants that you can't with Illumina. Um, so we could show the prevalence of antimalarial resistance markers uh, and variation in CSP. The technology, by its nature of the portability, uh, the fact that you can run it off a laptop, uh, the fact that it's not super expensive, um, it is well suited to training and capacity building um, so that we can you know, train people to do the sequencing themselves. Uh, and I think there's a lot of potential for cross-application to other high-priority pathogens. Malaria is sometimes described as being one of the big three, along with HIV and TB. Um, and so if labs have invested in nanopore sequencing for one pathogen, then they could apply it to others. Um, and thinking about the takeoff of sequencing in Africa that's happened because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there's been a huge rise in the number of uh, nanopore sequences on the continent. At the University of Ghana in Accra, they were already doing SARS-CoV-2 sequencing using nanopore when we arrived. Um, so there's a, um, a clear way in which uh, you know, labs could pivot to um, continue doing COVID sequencing, but also do other important pathogens. A lot of people to thank uh, who um, did this work, and I just particularly wanted to highlight um, Sophia Gagas, who led the lab work, Dr. Lucas Amengiratego, who co-conceptualized and co-led the entire project, um, and I'd also like to make special mention of my former PhD supervisor, Professor Dominic Kukowski, who sadly passed away a few weeks ago. That's all I wanted to say today, and I'd just like to leave you with this quote um, by an author who I like, the Nobel laureate, Dr. Wangari Matai. Thank you very much for listening.